So I'm, I'm going to provide an update this morning, today, on uh, development since our last meeting, which was two weeks ago today. Uh, there have not been many, but there have been a couple of significant ones. Um, I'm going to start with, you all should have, I brought some handouts, and everybody should have them on your table. This is, what this is, is a cumulative sort of matrix of significant developments that Khan and uh, Khan really put together with some help from other people. Uh, Khan, Khan put together a template, and what, and what each, each of us who's giving these regulatory updates every two weeks then supplements this, this grid with, with new developments. So, um, some of these, for those of you here last week, you'll see some of these were on the, were, you know, uh, were here last week and some are new. And the ones that are new are my entries. I'm not going to cover all of them today, just some of them, but I tried to be reasonably comprehensive in what we've got. You'll see most of them are Treasury and Fed developments. Uh, there is an NCUA development, a National Credit Union Administration development that I want to talk about at the end. Uh, Yesterday, you, you undoubtedly have, have read, or maybe many of you heard it, the uh, Secretary Geithner's uh, um, announcement of the financial stability plan. It was, uh, it was long on spirit and short on detail. Um, and in fact, uh, surprisingly short on detail. But having said that, I do think it's worth running through the, co the, the basic elements of it, to, because I think that, as he promised, over the coming weeks, details will be forthcoming, and I think that it, it's worth looking for kind of clues or, or signs in the, the sort of relatively general text he gave us yesterday about what, what is coming down the road. The, the financial stability plan that was announced yesterday will supplement the capital purchase, pro capital purchase program, which is itself a treasury design program to implement the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act. So this is an additional program. This does not modify the capital purchase program. So you'll see, for example, there are executive comp restrictions in the plan announced yesterday, or at least in broad brush form, that will not have any bearing on participants past or future in the capital purchase program. The first element of the plan announced yesterday, the financial stability plan, is what, what Treasury is calling the financial stability trust. And, uh, it's really another capital infusion plan. Um, it involves stress testing of banks. Every bank with $100 billion in assets or more will be required to be stress tested by its primary federal regulator, which will essentially mean doing what an examiner would do on a safety and soundness exam um, in uh, presumably much, uh, you know, in much, much faster, much quicker and arriving at a point where uh, the government would be comfortable after, you know, with the, with the results of that look, look that, that, that look, um, investing more money in this institution. But it's intended to be this, this financial stability trust has as its main element something that has been dubbed the capital assistance program, not to be confused with the capital purchase program. The capital assistance program will be available to banks that have undergone this stress test and have passed. It will be an effort, again, I, I apologize for the vagueness and, and for the sort of uh, uh, vagueness in, in what I'm telling you because there isn't any more detail at this point. But it will, what we know is that it will be a private-public uh, kind of partnership where the, where, where the Treasury, where the U.S. government will be standing ready to invest up to um, a certain amount of money as yet. Uh, there's no cap that's been announced, up to a certain amount of money in the form of preferred that will be convertible to common. Um, unlike the preferred stock that's the primary instrument being issued by banks taking capital purchase program money, this, this preferred will not count as tier one capital. So it's being described as contingent equity, it's convertible to common, and can then, once converted, boost a bank's tier one capital to support additional lending. Um, so uh, element number one is, is an additional capital infusion. Um, of the, of the kind I just described. Now, one of the major criticisms of the government's implementation of the ESA, the, the bailout law, has been that there was, that although Congress specifically authorized Treasury to strip bad assets off the books of banks, none of this is going on. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people, including I think Chairman Bernanke and, and Chairman Mayer <coughs> and others have said this was, a, this was a major, I mean, in recent weeks they've said this was a major mistake, that 
And I personally feel that, you know, it's just sort of axiomatic if you're going to rescue a troubled institution, you can't invest capital, right? You can't invest capital, you can't invest a dollar a day, if, whether you're the government or a private source, if you think it might be worth 50 cents tomorrow. So, you know, <laughs> hand in hand with, the, with an injection of equity has to come a cleansing of the balance sheet to take, you know, assets that may be worth one thing today, may be worth, you know, something less than that tomorrow off the balance sheet as part of this process so that you don't waste your capital infusion. And this new plan as its second element, the capital assistance program announced, I'm sorry, the, uh, the financial, financial stability plan announced yesterday does include as its second main component the idea of, of pulling these assets off the books of troubled banks. They're referred to as legacy assets, um, but they're really the, you know, you've heard them referred to as toxic assets in other contexts. Again, the government's looking to a public-private partnership um, to figure out ways to uh, really value these assets and then put them somewhere. Now, Bill is going to talk in depth about one, one possibility for where they're put, but um, which could conceivably be a bad bank, but um, they're going to be put somewhere. They're going to be worked out. Um, the investments themselves, I mentioned, the capital investments are what was said yesterday is they're going to be, going to be placed in a separate entity, the Financial Stability Trust. Now, whether um, these bad assets, as they're being worked out, are also held in that financial stability trust or not, who knows? There are no, no details given. Um, they're talking about spending up to $1 trillion um, to buy bad assets from the books of, insti from the books of um, institutions with bad assets. Um, the third initiative is a consumer and business lending initiative, which is really an expansion of a Federal Reserve program that was announced last fall but has not yet been implemented, that goes by the acronym TALF, T-A-L-F, um, which stands for Term Asset Backed Securities Loan Facility. And uh, what they're doing here is they're throwing more money. This, this is a program that the Federal Reserve cooked up, and obviously Treasury, the administration, thinks this is a good idea because they're expanding it in two significant ways. What this program does is provide funding, liquidity, in the form of loans to private investors who purchase asset-backed securities, um, largely consumer paper, <coughs> but um, uh, boat loan, car loans, boat loans, other consumer loans. Um, <coughs> two significant things about yesterday's announcements. One is the federal program had talked about the numbers going up to 200 billion. The Federal Reserve Program had, had as it was originally conceived and announced last fall, was 200 billion. Treasury yesterday said, actually, it, it will go up to one billion, so increasing by five the amount of dollars being thrown into to kind of unfreeze the asset-backed securities market, which in turn would, would thaw, you know, consumer lending across a wide spectrum. Um, the other thing that it does that's significant is, is it's going to also work for commercial mortgage-backed securities. So CFDS are now going to be, or likely to be, in this pool. There's been a lot of talk about about you know, credit freeze in, in that market as well. This initiative yesterday is an attempt to sort of broaden the uh, applicability of this program and it's hopeful, hopefully it's usefulness. The fourth element of the program is transparency, accountability, monitoring, and conditions. And it really just repeats a bunch of things that, a bunch of requirements that seem fairly obvious that if you get government money, you can't use them to, to buy back stock, um, you can't, uh, you know, um, uh, you can't pay dividends in excess of a penny a share until the government money is repaid. Um, stock repurchases, as I, I mentioned, are, are restricted. And using the money to pursue acquisitions of healthy institutions is, would be prohibited uh, with any of this money. Um, executive comp limits uh, do not, or the executive comp restriction, which, are, which will come, which will be announced under this program in the next few weeks, will conform to, will be consistent with the um, supplemental executive comp restrictions that were announced on February 4th. Now you may remember that those restrictions, by their terms, did not apply to any past or future participant in the capital purchase program. They're stricter than what's in the capital, the executive comp restrictions in the capital purchase program, but um, essentially what the government has done is divide a, draw a line between the institutions that took the capital purchase program money um, and and, and institutions taking government money from, from, from effectively this point forward in terms of, or I should say, under new programs. 
stricter rules apply. Those are the executive comp limits that were announced on February 4th. We're going to run through them really quickly when we get through with this, if we have if we have time. Um, you'll give me the okay, I trust. Okay, okay. absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, initiative number five announced yesterday was housing support and foreclosure prevention. This is just again much criticism over the last few weeks about the about about uh, Treasury ignoring the specific mandate in the ESA to come up with a uh, foreclosure prevention and mitigation plan, and um, 50 billion dollars of TARP money will be dedicated toward um, the implementation of a of a comprehensive mortgage foreclosure and prevention program. Again, no details. And finally, this is a little bit interesting too, um, the, the sixth element of the program announced yesterday is called Small Business and Community Lending. And this is really intended to unfreeze the SBA loan market. And um, to, uh, so, so uh, an amount of money not yet announced, not announced yesterday, but will be used um, presumably a significant amount of money to finance the purchase of AAA rated SBA loans to unfreeze secondary markets for small business loans, um, increasing the guarantee for SBA loans from 75 to 90 percent, and reducing fees for certain type of SBA loans. So this was, you know, in broad brush, it didn't do a lot for us. It really just confirmed that, that the government's certainly hearing the outcry from various <coughs> members of Congress and various constituencies about the um, lack of, of action uh, as part of the capital purchase program in terms of you know pulling bad assets off the books of institutions somehow getting them off is a necessary ingredient to a to a to a real fix to a, to a repair of the balance sheets of all the institutions that are troubled and the mortgage foreclosure and prevention mitigation the accountability we knew a lot of this stuff is, is common sense um, I want to just bring your attention quickly a letter that the inspector general of um, Neil Borofsky, he's the TARP Inspector General, has been sending to recipients of capital purchase program funds. It uh, is, is uh, sort of turning the screws as the agencies have been doing, but now he's doing it too, and it's uh, on, on use of proceeds. Now, for any of you who have been involved in uh, with a client, or for any of you who have been involved in take, in the capital purchase program, receipt of funds, you, you know that there is no actual, there is no operative language in the Securities Purchase Agreement that requires that the funds be loaned out. There is none. There's a recital that says you understand that the purpose of this is to promote lending, but there's no operative language in the Securities Purchase Agreement that requires that government money be taken by the recipient and loaned out. Um, now, anyone who, in light of the political outcry about that issue, among others, people who take the money and at least aren't trying to, to make the right noises and do the right things and actually put the money out or I think doing so at their peril. Borofsky sent out a letter dated February 6th to, to I, I think, uh, all of the institutions that so far have received CPP money. And um, he says, as this signed under the pains and penalties of perjury, uh, and he, by the way, again, is the Inspector General. I am requesting you provide my office within 30 days of this request the following information. A narrative, a narrative response specifically outlining your anticipated use of TARP funds, whether TARP funds were segregated from other institutional funds, your actual use of TARP funds to date, your expected use of unspent TARP funds, um, and then uh, and your, your plans with and then uh, your, your plans with respect to addressing the executive compensation requirements. Um, you know, money is is fungible, and and I don't. You know, we're we're going to be in discussions with some of our clients anyway that have taken the money about how you segregate TARP funds, and I mean, no one segregates TARP funds. You you'll track you know you'll track you'll track your increase in lending. You're, you'll track you know you'll certainly track your increase in lending. You can correlate it to new money, but no one segregates uh, you know no one segregates uh, money in that, in that way. Um, the uh, we have about five minutes left. Okay. I, I won't run through uh, the executive comp restrictions announced on February 4th. Will apply to two. I'll just be really brief here. Will apply to two types of programs. Again, going forward, not capital purchase program uh, participants. Um, companies, uh, companies receiving exceptional financial recovery assistance. This would be an AIG or a city. And then other financial institutions, financial institutions participating in generally available capital access programs. 
and um, Treasury in announcing these new restrictions said what we mean by that is a program, for example, like the capital purchase program. That would be an assistance program that's generally available. Um, the, the, the new or additional executive comp restrictions uh, that apply to participants in new generally available capital access programs are much more limited than those that apply on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis to those institutions needing exceptional assistance. Um, and they're just uh, uh, they're greater disclosure requirements. Some of the specific requirements are, are, um, are uh, some of the specific requirements are more onerous. I think the worst, the worst deal yet for anybody who's a you know, participant in the capital purchase program would be the provisions that are, are in the Senate version of the, sti uh, the stimulus bill. If those get, you know, if the, if the House embraces those kinds of provisions, then I think, you know, you've got, you know, you've got potentially the $500,000 cap on pay going down to $400,000. You've got restrictions on bonuses or incentive comp pay to your top 25 officers. I represent a lot of community banks, as the general people in the audience, and including my friend Steve Kukas, Nancy Wilsker, and others here, and I met Dave, Dave Hannon. And um, this could be very, a community bank, if you start imposing restrictions on, on bonuses or incentive compensation to your top 25 officers, you're, you've got some serious problems. Um, lastly, I just want to mention, you know, credit unions sort of fly under the radar, have been flying under the radar screen as far as the credit union industry has been flying under the radar screen as far as this whole financial, as far as the financial crisis has gone so far. Um, I started hearing rumblings of this. We, I will say, assuming that there's, you know, no reporters in the room. I'll say off the record, we represent four credit unions, um, and um, and I was hearing from some of them a few weeks ago that the the backbone of, of the um, corporate uh, credit unions have in their system what are known as corporate credit unions that function, you know, so like you know, to an extent like federal home loan banks. That system uh, invested heavily. Some of those corporate credit unions invested heavily in mortgage backed um, and other similar similar uh, securities that have uh, become problematic. And uh, essentially, the whole corporate credit union system um, is would have been at risk of melting down um, had the NCUA not stepped in on January 28th and rescued the principal corporate credit union with a $1 billion uh, rescue plan um, guaranteeing uninsured shares of, at all corporate credit unions, which is, so there's a, there's a central corporate credit union, then there's sort of a, a galaxy of other corporate credit unions, and then they in turn provide funding and liquidity to, to what are known as natural person credit unions, which are the credit unions that you see on the street. And um, they're guaranteeing shares of all corporate credit unions through February 09, and they're establishing a voluntary, voluntary guarantee program for uninsured shares through uh, the end of next year, 2010. They're issuing, NCUA is issuing a $1 billion capital note to the Central Corporate uh, Federal Credit Union and uh, is, is raising its premium assessments, which will impact every natural person credit union and uh, presumably uh, raising premiums by a lot, I understand, by, by a lot um, yeah, to, um, to try to pay for some of this. So it's going to adversely impact the financial well-being of every natural person credit union. I mean, banks are going to be getting some pass-through from the FDIC of an of an increase in in, in uh, deposit insurance assessments over the coming uh, coming uh, months and years to pay for some of this. But I think the actual hit that credit unions are taking is is of a much larger scale than what banks are taking so far. So that's an update of um, the developments the last two weeks. Do we feel questions? Yeah.